Thank you very much, Claudio. Ladies and gentlemen, first, uh, welcome to the United States. Welcome to the United Nations. Welcome to the Model United Nations, a program that I have supported for more than 30 years, going back to the time when I was a young governor in my native state. The theme of today's meeting is Change the World. I ask you to think about, one, can you do it? The answer to that is yes. Two, do you want to do it? Three, how do you want to change the world? And four, most important of all, how will you go about it? You are living in a world full of promise and full of peril. Every single day, you could spend 16 hours on the internet reading about good things and bad things that are going on. Of course, in this crowd, you might disagree on what was good and what was bad. But the point is this. There is one thing that's not disputable. You are going to live your lives in the most interdependent age in history. That is, technology and other forces are bringing our lives together in ways that are positive and negative, and you have to decide how to chart your life. I hope you will choose to try to change the world in ways that you believe are positive. I always tell people that if you look at all the positive things going on in the world, life expectancy going up, the number of people whose lives will now be saved with AIDS, used to be a death sentence going up, the incredibly explosive potential of information technology to start new businesses and build wealth, the amazing advances in human genome studies, which in all probability will have already raised the life expectancy of the young people in this group well beyond 90 years. All of this must be balanced against the serious threats of all kinds of ethnic, religious, and other kinds of conflict amplified by information technology and the power of all non-state actors which you see in extreme acts of terror or violence, but which is also seen in the fact that cyber crimes can be committed by non-governmental groups just as easy as by governmental ones. What are you to make of all this? Well, I can only give you my answers. And then we'll come back to what you're going to do. I believe the job of every young man and woman is to develop your mind, develop your heart, your consciousness, and your conscience in a way that builds the positive and shrinks the negative forces of our interdependence. 
There are many ways to do it. But if you do it right, you can change the world. In just a few days, we will celebrate in early April the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. He was 26 years old when he assumed the leadership of the greatest civil rights movement in our nation's history. One of his top aides, John Lewis, was barely 21 and 25 a few years later when he was almost killed in a demonstration. He is now 79 and a member of Congress from the state of Georgia. A few days ago, after yet another horrible mass shooting at the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in South Florida, finally the students said, we will not stand by anymore and allow killing after killing after killing after killing to occur when nobody takes any action to increase safety and to reduce the chances of mass killings because the politicians are at the mercy of the gun lobby. But a lot of people have said that for the last several years. The United States has more mass killings by far than any other country, not just in numbers, but on a per capita basis. But something about the determination and the strength of these young people, high school students in our country, caught the imagination of the country. And just a few days ago, in every state in the United States, young people their age held mass demonstrations in highly public places demanding basic gun safety legislation and pointing out that in our country, where there is a strong cultural tradition of hunting and sports shooting, where many people live in rural areas a long way from law enforcement and want to have weapons to defend themselves, nobody has proposed getting rid of those already guaranteed constitutional rights. What they have proposed is having adequate comprehensive background checks and getting rid of civilian possession of military assault weapons designed only to kill people, as well as large-scale magazines which make it easier to do in a hurry. People have said, oh, this is a great cultural battle. No, it's not. It's a battle for personal safety for the children of the United States. It's about public health and sensible law enforcement and asking <clears throat> the hunters <coughs> and other gun owners to help us save children's lives. They don't have to give up their rights to give more children the right to avoid mass shootings. But everybody just sort of yawns and goes on, except this time something changed. People your age have been strong and tough and determined and have said, we're going to change the world. We lived and our classmates died in this mass shooting, and we don't want to see anybody else die. They have been simple, straightforward, blunt, and clever at the way they've used their access to technology and media. They made a decision about what they wanted to change and how they wanted to do it. Will they prevail? Too soon to say. Depends on whether they're willing to pay the price of time to stay at it. Depends on how long we can concentrate on something after it's happened. Depends on a lot of things. But I can tell you this, I've been fighting this issue for a long, long time. The last time assault weapons were banned and we had a big step forward in background checks was when I was president. 
and I saw the gun lobby defeat a large number of congressmen who voted for my position to do it. For years afterward, I broke up in the middle of the night thinking about all those people whose careers had been ended because when they went for re-election, the people who agreed with them on this issue either stayed home or cast their votes on something else. So these young people instinctively, they understood this. So they have a chance to change American politics and society and increase public safety in a dramatic way. And if it happens, they deserve the credit. They did it. They started it. They've stayed with it. There's something like that that can be done by young people everywhere. You have to decide, what do you want to do? How do you want to get it done? But I can tell you this. The world is interdependent. You know how much conflict there is in the world. You know how many governments there are saying we have run away from each other. Our differences are more important than what we have in common. Build more walls between us. But no walls can keep out ideas. No walls can keep out the Internet. No walls can keep out dreams. And Intelligence, ability, the willing to work, willingness to work hard, the capacity to dream big. These know no geographic boundaries, no gender boundaries, no racial boundaries, no religious boundaries. And it may take a whole new generation of people to help us to learn to not get rid of our differences, but to embrace them while saying our common humanity matters more. This vast hall could be filled with the behavioral studies which show that diverse groups make better decisions than homogenous groups. Our lone geniuses if somehow we could pick the most brilliant person in this room and take you to the Secretary General's office and give you all the food and drink and whatever you wanted for two days, and all the rest of us poor souls were compelled to stay here, drinking colder and colder coffee and stale rolls. And during this period, 20 questions were fed into us and to you over two days, we would make better decisions because diverse groups make better decisions. One of the great questions before the whole world today involves the rise of tribalism, as you all know. Everybody's scared of immigrants that they don't know where they come from or whether they're going to be violent or not. People get insecure if they think their borders don't mean anything anymore. Some people just don't want to be around people anymore who don't agree with them on everything. And yet, the most thriving places are places that embrace diversity. They don't give up their own identity. They don't give up their own tribes. They just accept others as well. That is the great test of the modern world. It is the great question that will determine whether we can meet any of our other challenges, even things that seem unrelated, like climate change or fighting cyber terror. We have to ask ourselves simple, direct questions that go to the core of democracy and freedom and human rights. Does that mean that you all have to agree on every question about what Italian immigration policy should be? No. But it does mean that you have to acknowledge that there are a lot of very decent people who have been dealt a very raw hand in the Middle East and Africa and elsewhere, 
and somebody needs to give them a hand up and their families and their children in some way. So if not you, who? How should this be dealt with? If you approach the problem with the proposition that most people are good and decent and have a right to have the best life they possibly can and not to have their kids killed, then your differences will all be manageable. I could give you lots of other examples. But it all comes down to this. Cooperation is better than conflict. Compromise does not reflect a lack of conscience. Empowerment works better if everybody's empowered and you don't have to get stronger at someone else's expense. Today we see the stunning power of persistent economic inequality, social exclusion, and cultural alienation. You see it in just naked fear. You see it in the, the Brexit mentality and all the other divisive manifestations. But to seize the potential of the modern world, we have to find the fine balance between security and change, between order and creativity, between people being able to hang together with their own crowd and still embrace new forces and new people. If we fail in this, we won't be able to have effective governments. Look at all the governments that are failing all over the world today. Why is that? Because they can't find a way to get by entrenched interests, and they're all afraid to look their neighbors in the eye and say, let's hold hands and take a flying leap into a future that we build together. Don't you be afraid of that. I believe that this is the most promising period in human history. I believe with all the crazy things you read in the headlines every day, and we Americans get more than our fair share of opportunities to do that, on the whole, the world is moving in a better direction. Most of the economic and social trends are positive. I would love to be your age just so I can see what's going to happen. This summer, Hillary and I went to Hawaii, to the big island, to look at the universe through the largest telescope in the world. We could see beyond our own galaxy. And then we came down 4,000 feet to about 9,500 feet, where with bare eyes we could see the brightest night stars, the night sky, and all of the northern hemisphere. And I was talking to these brilliant astrophysicists, a couple of whom had won a Nobel Prize in the last few years, and I said, what do you all think about the prospect of life on other planets? And one of them looked at me and smiled and said, we have a vigorous debate about the probability of that. I said, what is the debate? He said, the difference in 90 and 95 percent. In other words, they all believe in a universe with millions of galaxies and billions of stars, the chance that there is no form of life on another planet is virtually non-existent. In our own galaxy, we found 20 planets in the last couple of years that seem to be far enough away from their suns and dense enough to support life. Still takes too long to get there now. My point is, wouldn't you like to be able to think about that? 
But you can't do it unless we can bridle our destructive impulses on earth, unless we can learn to raise all our children, to save the planet from climate change and still grow food and preserve nature and share the future. The key to the whole thing is figuring out a way to liberate people to chart their own course in a climate of cooperation. I had a remarkable man well into his 80s in my office today named Marty Atasari. He was the Prime Minister of Finland when I was President. And we worked together to try to help Russia and in become a democracy and build the world after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And we did a lot of other things, but his country, Finland, was just named the happiest country in the world. And I said, Marty, you know, you always, all you Finns are always trying to show a stiff upper lip, and how can you be the happiest people in the world? He said, I think we've grown happier because we kept the excellence of our school system while we had children from 45 new countries come into it. This is a country with barely over 5 million people. Last year, Norway won. A couple years ago, Denmark. All places of remarkable personal attainment and social cohesion and cooperation, absorbing and debating about how much to absorb new people. Italy and the United States, we've got a problem with immigrants, which is that our birth rate, yours is below replacement level, and ours is right at replacement level. There's another thing I would tell you, if you want to change the world, you have to recognize the power of demographics, population trends, birth rates. So the only way America, unless we do it entirely with machine productivity, can continue to grow and diversify and provide better opportunities and afford education and health care and all that, is to take more immigrants. We just had an election which can only be concluded as being something that was really anti-immigrant. You've all seen the debates we're having about building a wall along the Rio Grande River. Listen to this. Did you know that between 2010 and 2014, there were zero, no net new immigrants to the United States from Mexico? It was a non-issue. The only people coming across the Rio Grande River were people that Republicans and Democrats, all of us together, had once agreed America should help. And those are people from Central America who had been uprooted by the narco-trafficking and the violence that families and children were facing. In America, the crime rate of all of our immigrants, including those who came here without proper papers, is one half that of the native born. The small business formation rate of our immigrants is twice that of the native born. They are creating jobs for the rest of us. Yet you would never know it to read all the press about it. Why? Because it's always great politics to create an us versus them world. When Martin Luther King took over his leadership in the Civil Rights Movement at 26, he lived in a completely us versus them environment as far as his opponents were concerned. There were black people and white people, and never the twain shall meet. Not in education, not in public housing, not in jobs, not anywhere. And he had a different view. When Nelson Mandela became the leader of the African National Congress, he had a tribe. He was a descendant of royalty in the Zosa tribe in South Africa. 
He then became a multi-tribal leader of black South Africa. Then when he was elected president of South Africa, and he put the leaders of all the parties that had put him in prison in his cabinet. He became the leader of everyone. And by the time he died, he was the poster child for reconciliation, forgiveness, and wholeness. What's that got to do with you? Sometime before you get very far in trying to change the world, you will have to decide how to deal with the other, the people who are not of your race, not of your faith, not of your nation, not of your political group, or who just disagree with you. But you have more power to change the world than any group of young people in history because of the internet, because of the mass media. You can rock the world. You just have to decide. Do you want to do it? What is it that you want to do? How do you propose to do it? And how will you treat the others? Every year we bring together in America, my foundation does, all these young people from universities all over the world. And we ask them to meet and work together to change the world. One young person with no money came up with a unique way to label medicine and have it checked to make sure the medicine was not a forgery. In developing countries, about 30 percent of all medicine is adulterated and should not be taken. That company became known as Sproxel, and it is now worth about $500 million. And there is no telling how many lives that that simple idea has changed. I could give you lots and lots and lots of other ideas. A group of young Indian Americans decided how to build a sterilization machine out of neon lights for less than a couple of hundred dollars to allow surgery to be born, done in remote, poor rural hospitals at an affordable price. I literally could give you hundreds of examples like this. They're changing the world. Oh, you can change the world. You just have to decide, do you want to do it? Do you want to do it badly enough to pay the price of time and stick with it? And do you want to do it in a way that leaves everybody better off in a world where you're constantly expanding the definition of us and shrinking the definition of them? Or do you just want to help your us? If nearly as I can determine, people much older than you have not done such a great job of answering some of these questions. But you shouldn't be too hard on them either, because the world has undergone so much change in the last few years, and so many people have been left out of the economic progress. So many people have felt isolated from the social solidarity that comes from feeling really important in the society. And the psychological dislocation of all these changes at once has been profound. The trick for you will be to honorably oppose those who disagree with you without hating them, without looking down on them, without trying to drive them into a desert, but instead asking them to join your tribe 
not to give up their own. I close with this thought. I used to go to South Africa every year around Mandela's birthday because we became very close friends. I would celebrate it together. We would do things together. And my foundation had some very large healthcare and agricultural projects in Central Africa. In the highlands, when people meet on the road, many of the tribes, every, there's no wheeled transportation, people walk everywhere. And when they meet and someone says, hello, how are you? The response is not, I'm fine, how are you? The response is, in English, I see you. If you want to change the world in a good way, you have to see people. Hitler changed the world. The purges of Stalin and the mass slaughter of other regimes, I could go on and on, changed the world. They were designed to amass power in the service of a mass idea. But the individual people's stories were lost. They were no more important than dust in the wind. In a world <clears throat> with the kind of technology we have, it is morally unjustifiable to pretend that someone else's life is of less significance than yours. We have to learn to live by I see you, to believe that we can all win, that in order for you to win, I don't have to lose, and vice versa. And whether your cause is education, or health care, or economics, or scientific advance, or music, are mobilizing poor working people. It should be seen as service and bringing us together. If we learn not to debase and divide each other, but to respect and debate each other, everything will start working better. Governments will work better, and we won't condemn each other for honorable compromises. It does not take long to live a life. I can remember, as if it were yesterday, when I was your age, when all these young people I admired, these young African-American students, were risking their lives to integrate high schools and colleges. I can remember thrilling to the exploits of those who sought to make America a more just and decent place. I have now love, had the benefit of a good long life, and I know that the most important thing is persistence. Persistence in the cause of unity and harmony. There are no permanent victories or defeats in human affairs. That's why the rules are so important. That's why democracy and human rights and cooperation are so important. We're all going to be wrong sooner or later. So it's a good thing there are no permanent victories or defeats. But if you mess with the rules, if you elevate people to too much power that is too unaccountable, then irreversible damage can be done. We're not there yet. So I recommend you all take a deep breath. If you're from Italy, be proud of your country's devotion to first republics and then to democracies. I will always be grateful for Italy's support when we stop the genocide in Bosnia and then in Kosovo and many other things. 
You can change the world. You have to want to. You have to be willing to pay the price. Then you have to decide what do you want to do and how are you going to do it. But it all comes down, trust me, I've been doing this a long time. It all comes down to whether you believe we can all win or you can only win if somebody else loses. It all comes down to whether you believe that the world is about us versus them in a dog-eat-dog -dog fight now to the end of time, or whether the job of human beings early in this new century is to constantly swell the definition of us and shrink the definition of them. That will be a lot more productive and make your life a lot more fun. Thank you very much.